Well, hello there. This is Tony from Ephraim International Ministries. And uh, today we want to continue talking about a topic we started last time called uh, For the Love of God. And uh, just like I started off before, I just want to um, present to you something about the love of God and, and the fact that we're trying, the whole purpose of this teaching is because we hear the word love a lot being thrown in uh, organized religion in the local churches but the question is how does the bible define what love is what does god think love is not so much what our doctrine suggests okay because what i would say is god in his word defines how to love him and his neighbor i'm sorry and our neighbor and this is what this teaching is all about what does god say how each of us should treat each other, how we need to love each other, and of course, how to love God. What does it mean to love God? And, and this is the whole purpose of our teaching here. And of course, we're gonna use scripture to define this. This is not based on my opinion, okay? This is based on what he said from the beginning. And we all know that God does not change. What he established in the beginning is established forever why because his word is forever and he says himself i don't change now the, the fact of the, uh, the matter is is we change right throughout the generations but the condition of the heart of man remains the same it has enmity towards the things of god right and and as a believer these are the things we have to come out of this is the process of renewing our mind based on what his word says right so let's start off in the book of um, Deuteronomy, verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 7. Read a couple scriptures here, Deuteronomy 30, verse 7. And blessed be the name of Jehovah. It says, And Jehovah your God will put all these curses on your enemies, and on those who hate you, who persecute you. And you shall return and obey the voice of Jehovah and do all his commandments, which I command you this day. And Jehovah your God will make you have plenty in every work of your hand, and the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your cattle, and the fruit of your land, good. For Jehovah will again rejoice over you for good, as he rejoiced over your forefathers. Okay, so it says here that he's going to bless everything that you touch which includes the things of business, the things of your family, okay? The good things in life, the things that we that are useful for us every single day. Verse 10, For you shall listen to the voice of Jehovah your God to keep His commandments and His statutes, which are written in this book of the law. And if you turn to Jehovah your God with all your heart and with all your soul, Okay, so the book of the law. What is that? The books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, it's tangible. It's right in front of us. It ain't something that he made difficult for us, where it says that, you know, it ain't so high that you, you can't reach it. It ain't so low that you can't scoop it up. It ain't so far that you can't grab it. It's right in front of you. It's in your heart. Okay, he made it as simple as anything. Okay, um, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Again, the topic here is the love of God. What is it? Let God's word define this. Proverbs 6.16. And uh, many of us are familiar with these. A lot of us term this as the, the seven deadly sins. Okay. Well, let's get into it. These six Jehovah hates. Yea, seven are hateful to his soul. A proud look, a lying tongue, the hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked plans, feet hurrying to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and he who sows discord among brothers. All these things, I'm sorry, Okay, yeah, we're done there. Now, the thing that I want you to understand here is that 
All these things that God mentions here have all one thing in common. There is zero love portrayed here. Okay, again, the topic is the love of God. Okay, in fact, these are all things that are, according to God, are abominations unto Him. Okay, and that there is no way that one can be blessed if they practice these things. And uh, some of us might want to go over these things again on our spare time. But that's why it's so important to check yourself every day. Walk in front of that spiritual mirror. Examine yourself. Okay, because this is part of God's, uh, God's rule book for our life. Okay, now the question is, are any of us caught up in these, um, these seven things that God hates? Now we need to be uh, careful that that we, you know, we shouldn't think that we're not caught up in these things because we're so holy. Well, that's not me. Those are things that the world does. Yeah, you're darn right that these are things that the world does. But the problem is, is a lot of us still have the world inside of us. Remember, guys, just the day that you, 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 that you received Christ in your heart was a special day. Absolutely. Okay. Now your spirit man was sealed, saved for eternity. The problem is, is your mind didn't change, your flesh didn't change. Okay? Now those are the things that we need to work on. That's why the Bible says to renew your mind daily. Okay? And the process of, of us getting rid of the old man that Paul talks about. Okay, so we, we have to... Those things are, are, are a daily progress that we have to work on every day. Okay? So, like I said, don't think that none of us are not caught up in these categories. And I'm sure a lot of us can testify. I know I can sometimes that sometimes I have a heart that plots wicked plans that I have to watch out for. Okay? Or, or, or maybe some of us um, have a problem sowing discord with our brethren. We know how rampant that is in the church. Right? How many, how many of us are a false witness that speaks lies? How many of us have a, a problem lying in general? How many of us like to, like to brag about things? Have a proud look. Well, look what I did. Okay? So let's not think because you're a Christian that we are immune to these because I would suggest it's the total opposite, right? And the fact of the matter is, not only do these things um, are in our hearts, but I, I would suggest that the devil is going to work full time that we get into involved in these things. Why? Because you're a child of God, right? So things, I would say, get a little harder for you. So we have to watch out for these. Okay. Now, like I said, do you realize how rampant these sins are in the church? Every day, every day, every church has these issues. Okay. Now, like I mentioned last time about when you read the scriptures, about the, the, the context. Remember that uh, the, the audience that God is talking to when, when you read the Bible and most of the time, he's talking to his people. Okay, so if God hates these things, is he going to bless you when we fall into one of these categories? Let's think about it, guys. Let's get down to the ground here. Let's get ourselves out of the clouds. Right? And, and this is the process of examining ourselves. Are we, like I said before, are we looking at that spiritual mirror? Father, am I involved in one of these sins? And if I am, please show me so I can repent. That's the kind of heart that God looks at. Okay? Because the fact of the matter is we have to do our best to keep ourselves clean. We have to keep ourselves accountable. And only the Word of God will hold us accountable. Only the Word, not your doctrine not your opinions, okay? Not your uh, spiritual experiences. Only God's Word will help you keep, uh, keep yourself accountable. 
Uh, let's move on to um, the next verse, verse 20. My son, keep your father's commandments and do not forsake the law of your mother. Bind them upon your heart forever. Tie them around your neck. Okay, it doesn't say to nail them to the cross. It doesn't say that these are, 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 are bondage to you. In fact, it says bind them to your heart forever. It doesn't say bind them until Jesus comes and then don't worry about them. It doesn't say that. His word is forever. What gives us the audacity to determine when his word ends? Like, we need, to, we, we need to weigh our thoughts here, guys. We need to weigh the things that we've been taught. If it doesn't line up with the book, if it goes contrary to what God's already told us, then we need to throw it away. Okay, and, and that's what I'm talking about. These, these teachings out there that talk, that encourage us to, to forsake God's commandments. I mean, this is unheard of in the first century with the church. They never once um, displayed this kind of doctrine, not even close. It's only when Rome took over, that's when there became a separation and confusion. Verse 22, when you go, it shall lead you. When you sleep, it shall keep you. When you awake, it shall talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp. And the law is light. And reproofs of instructions are the way of life. Does that sound familiar? But what you read in the New Testament, how the Word of God is set for, for a, a reproof of instruction? Does it sound like that God wants us to do away with this? The law is a light. The commandment is a lamp. I mean, it's right, it's right here. It's life unto us brothers and sisters. Okay? So, the Word of God is going to keep us in the path of righteousness. It is our guide. It's our standard. If you throw it away, what's your standard? Well, I'm just going to be led by my heart. Well, there's your first mistake because the Bible says your heart's going to deceive you. Okay? There's no higher standard in this world than God's Word. And the, the sooner we understand that, the sooner we have that, this personal revelation and knowledge, the better off we're going to be. Okay? Now, not only are we told to come out of the whore, the church, but we need to be different than them as well. Along with being different than the world, because, and the reason why I, I say, that, say that is because there ain't much of a difference between the church and the world. If there was, I wouldn't be saying that. But the fact of the matter is, there isn't. Okay, Houston, we have a problem here. There is a problem in organized religion. Okay? The Spirit of God hasn't been there in generations. It's left. Just like we read in the book of Ezekiel, when the, the prophet looked through that knothole, and he seen the glory of God depart from the temple. Meanwhile, they're in there doing this, praising God, and God was nowhere to be found. That's exactly what we have today in organized religion. The people thinking that God's there, and He ain't. Alright? And I'm talking about the manifestation, the anointing of God. I'm not talking about His omnipresence. He's everywhere. We know that. Okay? Now, like I said, we need to come out of that. And the thing that we have to understand is to know to do good and not do it is sin. So if you're involved in this type of uh, setting, well, I don't, I don't agree with everything, but I agree with some things. Well, guess what? You're involved in the good and the bad, and you're responsible for both. So you're better off getting out, even if it means that you don't have a fellowship for a couple months or a couple years. You're better off getting out learning on your own, find some solid teaching, a solid ministry. We have a lot of stuff on our website that you can that you can look at. I'm not saying that we have it all together. I'm not suggesting that. But we are seeking 
We are seeking the ways of God and how to do things better. We're going back. We realize that the Bible does not start in the book of Matthew. It starts in Genesis. The Torah is our foundation, not the book of Ephesians, or Gal is certainly not the book of Galatians. Okay, so we're trying to lay down the tracks again. Um, but like I said, like when the truth of God is presented to you, okay, and you do nothing about it, in your life, you are then responsible for that truth. And it's going to be held against you on that day. So we need to, we need to remember that. God will put you in a position to hear something, if you, and if you do nothing about it, it's on you. It's on me. Let's turn to the book of uh, Zechariah the prophet. Zechariah the prophet, chapter 18, verse 16. These are the things that you shall do. Each man speak the truth to his neighbor. Judge with truth and justice for peace in your gates. Amen to that. And let each devise no evil in your heart against his neighbor. And love no false oath for all these things that I hate, says Jehovah. Okay, now, now when, when you hear that says... You know, it, it's, it's like God putting a seal on what he just spoke. And we need to pay close attention to that. Well, my neighbor's dog comes to my yard every morning at 8 o'clock and he, he doo-doo's on my lawn. And I tell you, man, I'm, I'm just going to, if he does that again, I'm going to grab a baseball bat and just give him the business. Okay. I mean, re remember, guys, God is always looking at the intent and the attitude of your heart. And God's going to use these situations, like the dog I just talked about, to see where you're at. <laughs> okay? You know, God, I know some of us don't want to hear this, but God will purposely use and bring people in your life to see purposely if you can love them. How else is He going to know? How else are you going to know where you're at with Him? How are you going to know the, the type of things in your heart that you need to get rid of if they don't come out at first, right? And God, and that's why God gives us these opportunities so that you know what to work on, right? I mean, it's easy to go to your neighbor and grab him and uh, you know punch him in the nose and then grab his dog and have him taken away to the dog pound. But is that what God really wants happening? What are you going to learn from that? Absolutely nothing. How are you going to grow from that? You're not. Not only are you not going to grow, but you, you, you'll probably go backwards. Okay, and, and I, I know I've said this before, but your biggest problem is you. My, guess, my biggest problem is me. And God is only interested in how you're going to react when He brings these people in your life when he brings the people that are not real lovable right Yeshua says it's easy to love those that love you it's easy have a good time tell some jokes right but how easy is it to love those who are not that kind of rub you the wrong way okay and again context we're talking about the brothers we're talking about people in the community. Okay, he ain't talking about the Satanist that lives three blocks from you. He's talking about the community here. Okay, again, context. Okay, some of us might have a certain uh, squabble with a brother or a sister that we totally think, hey, you know what? It's totally their fault. They're at fault, not me. Do you know how to get rid of this? Do you know how to get 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 to, to a point where you get his heart right or her heart right? It's very easy. You go to that person and beg them to forgive you. Yeah, you heard me right. Go beg him to forgive you, and you would be surprised how that's going to break that person. 
Okay, now I know the problem here is our flesh. And it's going to cause us to have this, what we call the, the Fonzie syndrome. How many of us remember Font, Mr. Fonzie from uh, Happy Days? Where he had a hard time saying, you know, wrong. Okay? But the, the fact of the matter is, what difference does it make if you're wrong or not? If you have the ability, now listen to this, guys. If you have the ability to mend the heart of your brother and sister, and you don't do it, then you're both guilty. We need to understand that the command is to love, not to justify. Who are we to decide if they're deserving or not? Guess what? Neither are you or me. Justification only comes through the Son of God. Now, does going to your brother or sister in that fashion completely cure you of, of being unlovely? No, but it starts the process. It puts us on the path to understanding the kingdom of God. Okay? And that's what Yeshua came to preach. He came to preach the kingdom of God. But the kingdom starts within you. It starts here. He's trying to get us used to acting out the principles of the kingdom. What's the kingdom? One day, it's going to come down. The new Jerusalem, that's the kingdom. He's trying to prepare us for that. He says, I go away to prepare a place for you. Where do you think that is? In Chicago? No. It's up there. It's coming down for us. These are principles of the kingdom of God. This is when we get our new bodies. He changes our hearts. He writes the law in our hearts. So that, guess what? Everyone's going to know Him. Everyone's going to love each other. But it's, He wants us to get used to it now. He put that seed in us. He put that deposit of the Holy Ghost to get us to yearn for Him, to yearn the things of righteousness. Oh, that's so exciting. It is so exciting. But like I said, it's the beginning. But we need to work on that beginning. Because if we don't, then guess what? God's going to put another person in your life to do the same thing. And you'll keep doing that until we get it right. Some of us, it might take us 30 years. Some of us, sadly, will never, ever understand this truth. And we're going to go to our grave having some ought in our heart, having a, a, a certain, like I said before, a certain squabble in your heart that hasn't been taken care of. Some of us will carry that to our graves. Why? Wrong teaching. Or we're just too darn stubborn. You know what I mean? And, and, and that's why it's so important to get this thing set out now. Because it could determine our place in the kingdom of God. Okay? But we're going to have to go through this temptation until we beat it. If it, if it has to do with, with, with having a hard time loving your brother because of what they did to you. But the only way to defeat these temptations is to first be conscious of it. We have to walk around every day having this, this mindset being sin conscious. Every thought, every word, every deed that has to be filtered through God's word. Okay? Think about being in a place where you're doing that every day. Every moment of the day. Are we doing that? Or are we caught up with um, the cares of this world? Okay? Understand, to think ill will toward your brother or your sister it is a sin in the eyes of god okay and like i said it's rampant in the church we know that but do we think of this as something that's serious because it is serious it's going to prevent us from walking in those blessings from getting our prayers answered and some of us don't even know 
that is it is a sin. And if you don't know about it, how can you repent of it? Okay, and you know, and, and this might mean that we have to, some of us have to search our hearts and ask God to show you the people in our life that have done you wrong. Right? Because what this eventually does is it's going to cause a release in the spirit of, of both of you. Both of your hearts. That cannot be done unless somebody initiates it. Hey, why, why can't that person be you? Why can't it be me? Okay, like, because what usually happens is, that I'm sure some of you have, have, have been through this situation where you, you, you go to that person and ask for forgiveness, apologize to them. And a lot of the times, what happens? They'll say to you, you know what? I, I should have apologized to you a long time ago. This is ridiculous. And there's, there's a relief that comes. But it takes somebody big enough to initiate that relief. This, this is part of growing up in the things of God that goes past the things of salvation. That goes past getting filled with the Holy Ghost. Because if we can't get past this, brothers and sisters, we're not going to be good to God. We're not going to be good to the community. Like, just think about it. If you hadn't gone to that person ever, and you and you would have kept that ought with him or her in your heart, or vice versa for the rest of your lives. Think about the bondage that that person in yourself would would be holding on to, and the things that you could have prevented God from doing in your life. Okay, so again, like I said before, it doesn't matter if you're wrong or not. Are you interested in mending and releasing your brother and sister from that? Okay, like these are the kind of kingdom principles that we have to live by. Okay, this has everything to do with, with, with God's law. It's in there. See, you have to understand something, guys. Yeshua did not come to teach anything new. The Bible says that there is nothing new under the sun. He simply had the heart to have us go back to the rudiments of God's Word. Again, I mentioned this last time. For the most part, he was fighting against the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees were putting on extra rules, regulations, traditions upon the people that were gearing them away from God's Word. And Yeshua was trying to get them back. Okay? Yes, Yeshua was the Son of God, but He was also a prophet. And what's the main job of a prophet? Consistently back from the days of Genesis. What is a mark of a prophet? One mark. The mark of a prophet is to always gear people towards back to the commandments of God. Every single one of them. Right? Israel was going down the wrong path. God sent the prophet. Repent and get back to the covenant. Okay? And Yeshua was no different. And thank God for that. We're going to continue next time with this topic. Very, very important, guys. Please get a hold of this. This is going to set some of us free. And um, amen to that. Shalom.